Mushroom Wonderland. Yeah. So does everybody know what a hedgehog is? Okay, this is not a hedgehog. This is a head no. Hedgehogs are the spiny animals that walk around. So this is a hedgehog mushroom. Or a back east, we usually call them sweet tooth. So, so hiddenums is another example of a mushroom we used to use two names for. Umbilicatum, if they were small and had a little belly button, and repandum, if they were big. And then those things in between, depends on, you know, it's like you just split them up and go, like, these are small, we'll just call these um, umbilicatum, those are big. But it turns out we have, what, like six or seven different species of hiddenums in the Northwest. Does that matter to most people? Not really. Because you can eat them all. The one of is like Washington Yenum and the, one of the big ones tends to get bitter. A little bit of bitterness to them sometimes. So when you find really big hedgehogs, just take a small bite and taste it, make sure it's not a bitter one. Does everybody know how to identify a hedgehog mushroom? Okay. So the peach colors, the you know, are white or creamy, the spines and the underside are pretty brittle, so you can, if they're not completely dry, break them off really easily. And they typically have some sort of orange staining on the stem. Closely related to chanterelles. So like chanterelles, if you dehydrate them, you gotta powder them because they will, they, they will not reconstitute very well. There's a lot of other tooth fungi on the table. Uh, the hidnellums and, and sarcodons. Uh, and so you did, this year there was a lot of hidnellum ceruleum, yep. the blue tooth. Yep. <laughs> and so can people just yell at the people on the outside of the circle because I can't keep yelling it so much. There's a big room they can walk away to. Um, so anyway, Hidnellum ceruleum, the blue tooth, it's baby blue colored when young. And mm -hmm. you know, sort of like, it can be bright blue. But then as it ages, it just becomes brown and grayish. So when you find old Hidnellums or Hidnellums that lack color, you have to cut them in half to identify them. So if you want your tooth fungi identified on, you know, like our eye naturalist or something, include a photograph of them cut in half. And the other thing I would caution about with hidden elms is a lot of them are, are pretty sensitive in habitat they grow in, and they all grow from these large mycelial mats, so use restraint when picking them. Uh, because they are not, they're not, especially in Europe, it's been shown that they're not a mushroom that survives disturbance. So overpicking and acid rain kills them quickly. So dyers use restraint. Uh, so when you cut ceruleum in half, this is what it looks like. It's orange and has blue and orange zones in the cap. You can pass this around, look at it if you want. So this is, you know, so even though it's like brown, it can be old and brown and look like the other things like the and petii, it has the orange flesh, the blue zones throughout the whole period. So Noah, were you saying all Not all. But you know, stuff like you know, regium, you know, sign of podium, especially the blue one on the coast. Uh, you know, if you know, pecky is pretty common, and, and um, fusco indicum is another one that's fairly common. But yeah, and just don't pick every last one of them. And remember that that a hidnellum will this fruit body will be out from late July or early August until deep freeze and producing spores that whole period. So if you go out and pick this thing in August, you cancel out a whole year of spore production. And a lot of them are, are you know, prefer old growth, a lot of these species prefer old growth forest. So just think about that when you're picking these things. You know, there's, there's a lot of like, Dyer's polypore, it's everywhere, it's not going to go anywhere it seems. Uh, that's, you know, you know. You just try to use respect. Noah, how does that work compared to swap you learned? So Swabiolans, we had a single specimen earlier, but it's on the dryer. Swabiolans has a blue stem base, a paler cap, and a really sweet odor. So, so I mean, it's sweet grass or oatmeal cookies. You know, it's a really oh, yeah. sweet And don't cookie. stick it in your freezer, because it will make everything smell like that. <laughs> mm. Another tooth fungus that, I mean, the, the bear's head, the heresia, yeah. this is not in very good shape, but this is a fungus that loves higher elevation old growth forest around here. So, you know, you get up into the big hemlock and, and firs, uh, you can find a lot as much. We had a really good year, but of course, what's at 3,000, 3,500 feet right now? No. Snow. Snow. Yeah. Season's over. Uh, so, yeah, bear's head, it's just, you know, very easy to recognize. If it's these white icicles, clumps of spines facing down, you have a heresium.
and there's a few different species of them, but you don't really have to tell them apart. The, the last couple on the table worth mentioning are some of these truffles that are still here. Uh, black truffle, Lucangium, so you know, Rye the Truffle Dog did very well. Uh, Sopastus around the smell, this is Oregon Black. It's really fragrant. And then the other one that's, that's still on the table uh, are Rhizopogons. So Rhizopogons are the Basidio truffles that are closely related to Sewillus. They're the bouncy ones. <laughs> bouncy <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> they're edible, but they're desirable. Who eats Sewillus? Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind Sewillus flavor, or some of them are sort of Sewillus flavor, and a really like eating sponges, you may like them. So, rise of hope and glee, but is is really sponge-like. It's really dense sponge-like. Like uh, and, and so it's you know it, it, it's a really weird texture. Some of them are okay flavored. Uh, this one, this is a little bit garlic so odor. So I like rise of pogan odors. Um, Heather does not. So you know when, when Rye's finding rise of pogan, she's like, no, no, don't find any more of those. And I'm like coming behind her, was like, no, I want that, I want that. Um, but yeah, I mean they're 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 not toxic. But not very many people eat rice of pogon. You can throw them in stews and stuff. You make chips too. Yeah. Mike Decker makes chips. I had it in a Chinese restaurant. They served it. There's some rice of pogon species that are desirable edibles, but there's probably about a hundred different species of rice of pogon here, and they are absolutely impossible to identify the species. Yeah, there's a couple easy ones and a lot of hard ones. Are they still subject to parasitism like other suwillus? Like, uh, can you find? No, they're not. Um, I mean, like like Crogonphus, Gonfidius. Yeah, there is um, in Europe. There's a there's a um, Gonfidius that grows a rise of Pogon, and we oh. don't know what the Gonfidius on the coast and the spruce is growing on. Uh, oh. We tried um, tried getting root tip samples. Uh, Peter Kennedy's lab in Minnesota does a lot of work on that. Um, we sent some samples that cannot figure out what it's growing on. Interesting. Okay. Something's going on. There. <laughs> so, so this thing here, this kingbo leaf. Uh, this is something that, that um, Shannon and Sandra got when they were out Cortinarius hunting. This goes to show you that they don't just pick Cortinarius. Uh, it's the one next to it. So these two were fused together at the base. And what was really unusual about this one, this is the heaviest bully king bully I've ever felt. I've never felt something this dead. And what's also really unusual about it is king bully season was about a month and a half ago here. And for some reason, this thing hung on. This was up near White's Pass, just it's below crazy. the saw, right? So, so, and Shannon's like really on, the, on Highway 12, and I was just saying, ran across the highway, <laughs> risking death to go to the saw. So he wants to see the mushroom growing outside the house. Because it's bigger. Yeah, okay. Probably not the best idea. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is an average thing. This is a massive edgeless, but what, what I like to say, what's really different about this one is how heavy it is. You know, typically when they're this size, they're fairly light. So I'm kind of curious how big this thing would have become if it hadn't been taken. I mean, because they would have spread out a lot more. So I just want you to pass this around and feel it, uh, because this has been sitting around for two days now. And it's still probably <laughs> over five pounds. Yeah, yeah. And it's lost a lot of water. And there's no worms in it, I've seen. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, Gordon will probably start spanking it for us. <laughs> um, okay, the other, the other massive thing on the table <laughs> is this white chanterelle that Phil Carpenter brought in. Wow. So this is a single white chanterelle that just became like super rose cone. Uh, it just, you know, it's so impressive. So normally, uh, Jeez. I don't know if I can't get the wide screen. There we go. That's some pretty big, pretty bulky. There we go. I got it. No, it's all right. I got a picture of you with it. Ah. It's still edible. So they are edible, and the best thing to do with them is kind of a novelty. But just get like. You know, different colored, you know, Kool Aids or you know those big flavored fruit juices, and throw it into them. The ones with the dyes, 
and then you throw these in, let them sit in there for a couple hours and pull them out and you'll have like purple grape flavored wines and red cherry flavored <laughs> wines. They take the color of the dye really well and the flavor and stuff. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. Let's just come back. And one last, if you want fruits of the forest, and you have coffee, if you want questions yeah, of Cascadia, you better hurry. Um, we're going to leave very soon. Yeah. So, quickly, Christian, end of here. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll do one more table. Uh, okay, so if you use, let's see, what's on here? This is all Lepiota, oysters, or Yeah, really. Uh, and wax caps. So everyone knows the wax caps, right? This is like one of the most charismatic groups of macro fungi because of their bright colors, um, but also because of um, sort of their ecological relationships. How many, how many of you have heard of uh, this acronym CHEG, C-H-E-G? What does it mean? I can't remember at the moment, but... <laughs> Cloveria, Hygrosophy, yeah. and Teloma, and Geoglossaceae, so the earth tongues. So these are the little club fungi, the Cloveria, the Hygrosophy, which are the wax caps, and Teloma, which are the pink gills, and then the earth tongues. And the reason that we have this acronym, which we got from European workers, but now we've adopted it here in, in the West, is that these mushrooms tend to grow together. So you find this assemblage of very widely, you know, not closely related mushrooms um, that form an ecological guild or a suite. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a cedar forest or a redwood forest or a cypress forest or certain kinds of bogs, you will find... And in Europe, it's always non-fertilized meadows. Yeah, so nitrogen really destroy habitats in, in many cases. Um, you will find these organisms growing side by side. And there are people who just get really excited. They're like Chegg nerds. They're Chegg geeks. They want to go find wherever Chegg is happening and, and collect all the diversity there. Hmm. Don't laugh at me. Um, <laughs> so what if I'm a Chegg nerd? Um, and it, it's not just those four. You could continue that acronym way out. There's pseudobiosporas that grow there. Um, there are certain ascos that grow in those habitats. So it's actually a really cool lineage. And one of the things about this ecological guild is that um, they seem to be fruiting in places where there aren't a lot of other mushrooms. So one of the ideas for why they all cluster together and appear in the same places is that they're not very good soil competitors with one another, or sorry, with, with other mushrooms. And so they need to sort of escape uh, the amanitas, the rustulas, the bolites, all of those things that are potentially really good soil competitors in mycorrhizal forests. And so they seek out, or at least are selected for in these habitats where there aren't mycorrhizal trees so they can't support those other mushrooms that would compete more strongly with them. Um, so it's a really cool phenomenon, and you do have a lot of it going on here in Cascadia, but anywhere in the country where you get one, keep an eye out for the others. Um, you may find yourself amidst the chig. <laughs> So it's a really old, like, you ever heard of Ricola, the, the conifer, western conifer chicken? Uh, I mean, if you want to eat this mushroom, what I say is only eat it if it's really soft and bright yellow on the underside. Even so, a bunch of people get sick from eating that. So eat it sparingly the first time. Don't eat Pictoporelles fulgens thinking it's a chicken mushroom. Just because it's an orange polypar, people. Uh, the underside has relatively large pores that are like slightly you know, irregular shape and angular irregular pores and it has a little bit of fuzzy top but not a chicken, a chicken. You taste it. <laughs> it's not dangerous it's to eat that, is it? Is Pycnum porellus dangerous? It's really tough. Okay. I know it's really soft and it's not, uh, so far not bitter or spicy. So you would have a hard time digesting it. I don't want to eat it. I just it would be nice if it's bitter and it tells you right away. I mean, size a lot and texture. A young latiparus should be soft and juicy. Uh, you know, by the time Pictoporellus is at a size, you start noticing it. Uh, it should be relatively tough and leathery. Okay, and that's what the mushroom is doing when it's not on the rustula. What is the rest of its life cycle? Is it on the mycelium of the rustula? Does it have its own mycelium and then only attach to rustula when it's fruiting? Or is it a spore bank in the soil that when the, the little, the baby little rustlas are formed on the ground, says, aha, it's my chance to grow, start germinates on those and starts growing? We have no idea. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> wow. so, and, and, and in that, because you know the rustle of mycelium is huge, so it probably doesn't insect all of it, otherwise it would wipe out 
medical yes. quality. Yes. So, <laughs> what makes a good parasite? <laughs> Something yeah, goes doesn't, in your house. doesn't obliterate the host. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need the host to survive. Mm -hmm. And and it's funny because when you look at at lobster mushrooms, they when they're mostly fruited, early season before rains, mm -hmm. and, at least in the northwest, and then. In, the, in this time of year, you're getting mostly russulas. These things have been around for months. Uh, you know, you're getting mostly the, the uninfected russulas. And then the distribution of lobster mushrooms is really weird because it's like in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it barely makes it. There's like one or two records in the extreme southern valley, um, you know, the Southern River Valley in Alaska, uh, down to Mendocino County in California. And Cascade Mountains about halfway down Oregon, I think, and then it starts disappearing. And then the Southwest, like Colorado and New Mexico, or not Colorado, Arizona and New Mexico, and barely into Colorado. And then East Coast, Appalachian Chain, up into Quebec. So it has this really weird disjunct population, and not in Alberta, right? Right. Yeah, so, so it just has large areas. It doesn't occur, even though its hosts occur in these areas. And so why is that? You know, why does it live in the extremely dry southwest that gets monsoonal rains, but doesn't live in the California areas that get monsoonal rains? Yeah. Or, you know, they get, you know, Mediterranean rains, you know, winter <laughs> rains. It doesn't make sense. <laughs>